Thank you, Holly, for bringing this in for me. It's very nice of you. Don't forget your stools. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You know, the church is, uh, is under attack. Is that shocking? Well, I should. It's not, it's, it's nothing, nothing new, nothing's changed. It's been that way ever since we can find, you know, where the name of Jesus is being proclaimed. Uh, the church is under attack. And we are not to be uh, caught off guard by that. It should not surprise us. Uh, the beauty of it is it's perfectly in God's plan to use those attacks to bring him glory and to evangelize the world. Uh, that's what the Word of God tells us. And the Word of God is true, and anybody that disagrees with that is a liar. That's how he puts it. It wasn't, you know, I'm just telling you what it says. Um, I want to encourage you through the reading of today's word, and I ask you to, if you're, if you're able to turn with me, it's in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through the end of the chapter. Okay. Now, Pastor, you're teaching about um, combating fear with love. That's going to be very interesting. It is. It's an awesome subject. <laughs> All right. Can't wait to hear it. Uh, let's listen to this and see what the Word of God says. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Oops, I'm sorry, I am reading from 1 John, not 1 Peter. One starts with a J, one starts with a P. Easy mistake. Right, Emma? Okay. 1 Peter, uh, chapter 5, beginning with verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you, be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility for God. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that he have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. There's a wonderful promise in there about him establishing you, him making you an overcomer. And what we need to do is humble ourselves. Humble ourselves towards Him. The way we humble ourselves toward Him is by humbling ourselves towards one another. By humbling yourself, it starts out by saying that the younger should submit themselves to the older. We should submit ourselves to one another. He's going to establish us. He will give us victory. He will give us all, all these things that we're supposed to be laying at His feet. He'll take care of it. That's something to really, um, gosh, it stands in contrast to what the world tells us, doesn't it? Stark contrast. But it's truth. It's truth right out of the Word of God. Joellen, would you join me up here with, uh, helping with this music? 
today. Thank you. All right, so we've got some songs picked out. And for those of you that are fairly new, um, let's see, we have, everybody here has been here a while, as I look around, we have Karen, we have, um, you know, Jaden and Chris, those folks may not even be aware that Joellen is a master pianist, and she is phenomenal when it comes to accompanying in, in church hymns and church music, so we are very blessed that she can step in and has agreed to help me this morning. And let's start out by turning to number 26, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Just, just let that image bring you comfort this morning. And the words as we sing this morning, number 26, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. <laughs>
16, he giveth more grace. Okay, um, how about we go to 418? superpower strength with this surgery for some special gifts. One of them is eyesight. I could see things that Granny could not. And uh, pointed him out to her. Oh. That, was was that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> that was a mistake. That's scary. Yes. How many years of marriage did you take for him? <laughs> well, 40, 44. Never <laughs> point one. So don't give up. We're still learning. That's right. That's right. That's right. We may not be able to grow hair, but we can do other things. Amen. So this is perfect. I'm, I'm absolutely comfortable, and I appreciate your prayers, and uh, it's awesome. I'm going to be totally healed of this thing if it kills me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Trivia question. What was the great triad of strength of our country um, that our country used to project our military power around the world during the last half of the 20th century? Air Force guys ought to know this. Herb? Mary and the Navy and the Air Force working together. Um, the Navy taking through the waters, the Air Force taking through the air. Yeah. 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 Y
Army takes care of the land, the Air Force takes care of the air. The Air Force carried the brunt of the load. Let's just be honest, okay? <laughs> so, let's just be honest. Actually, the, 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 the vehicle that was used to project power directly was the Strategic Air Command, SAC. You guys remember SAC? They had a triad. It was air-launched cruise missiles, submarine-launched cruise missiles, and intercontinental ballistic missiles. It was an awesome triad. Uh, I, uh, I had the privilege, Granny and I did, we, we were in Strategic Air Command from 1981 to 1988. That, during those seven years that I was in SAC were the years that I basically learned to live without sleep because we were on duty 24 hours in those days and uh, sometimes during the course of the night I would get called back to work anywhere up to every hour uh, during the night. Uh, we got so used to when the phone rang, instantly we would be awake. Once you realize the strength of that triad, the strength that we had, we became, we became quite confident in our ability uh, to face our enemy. Um, and that, uh, and that the, the thought of battle really was not so much something to be feared, but rather to be met with anticipation of total success. We thought we would win. In fact, we wore hats that had a picture of a missile going over to Russia that said, when you care enough to send the very best. <laughs> That's what we did. So we were pretty cocky in those days. Uh, this triad of power was developed for one reason, really, and that was in response to fear. If you'll remember, even from the 60s, when we were kids in school, the big fear was uh, uh, nuclear bombs dropping all over the United States. And we, um, uh, the fear of the communists in those days, that they would overcome us if any opportunity ever offered itself, uh, was an ever-present fear. And the fear was deep, and the fear was real. And it swept our country. So our country responded to that fear uh, with strategic air command. So anticipating the communists as being the ones to most likely fire the first shot, our response had to be so overwhelming that they would be convinced that war wasn't worth it. So uh, Sack called that approach the doctrine of massive retaliation. I don't know if you, you old Sack guys, maybe I'm the only one. Herb, were you ever in Sack? No, I was not. We were taught well the doctrine of massive retaliation. And it worked. They never fired a shot, did they? Because they knew that if they did, we would. And if we did, they would not fire again. That was the whole idea there. Our enemy feared us then more than we feared them. Things got turned around. And there's a biblical principle that was at play there that I didn't even realize at the time, but Ecclesiastes 4.12, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That nuclear triad was so strong that the enemies that we feared, feared us even more. We put them in the spot. Today we'll continue to talk about taking courage during a time when the spirit of fear has made inroads all around us. Uh, we can take courage because God has put together his own triad of power to battle fear. His own triad of power. Once you realize the strength of that triad, the thought of, of battle no longer becomes a thing to be feared, uh, but rather to be met with anticipation of success. We will win. We are going to win. You know why? Because we already have. We already have. And there isn't anywhere in the world that God's triad of power can't reach to engage fear. There isn't anywhere in the world it can't reach. And God's triad uh, it, of power is found in is 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. And his, his, his triad of power includes dunamis, which means an overwhelming power. From where we get our English word what? Dynamite. Dynamite. Power. It includes agape, which is our English word. That's the one we're going to talk about today. And uh, it's a love with our commander, our commander-in-chief. 
and our fellow soldiers as we battle this enemy we call fear. And the last uh, piece of the triad is sophronismos. It's a Greek word that talks to a disciplined mind, uh, capable of self-control under duress. So what does the mind do when fear injects into the brain? Panics, right. He doesn't want that for us. So this, this triad of power that he talks about in 2 Timothy chapter 1 is more than a match when we face our old enemy fear. We need not fear, fear. And I believe Satan is weaponizing fear and he's using it today to control the human race. In my, in my, as far as I know, uh, this is the first time in human history that fear has entirely engulfed the globe. Sure, it, it, it's been regionalized here and there through the course of history. Uh, but right now, the fear that he has so su successfully implemented has engulfed the entire world. And his minions are using this opportunity uh, to do things like silence the gospel from spreading. He's using it to close down churches. He's using it to shut off hope from anybody around us. He hates the gospel, Satan does, and those who spread it so much that he thinks nothing of destroying the whole world um, if that would stop the seed of that gospel from spreading. So this battle with fear is spiritual in nature. And I apologize for the, 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 my jug here. It's just water, I guarantee you. But uh, that anesthesia, it makes me so dry that I'm just dried up. But the absolute worst thing that could come of this fear is that Christians would bow to it. That is the absolute worst thing that could happen. Christians should be a living example of courage in, in, in the face of this enemy we call fear. The church of the living God is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. We are the representation of God to the world. The physical manifestation of God to the world is the church. That is us. So we need to be that beacon on the hill. As we know, Winston Churchill once said, fear is a reaction. Courage is a decision. If you haven't already, I want you to make a decision. I want you to make a commitment with me that you will not fear what God has overcome. And as we know, he has overcome all things. Fear should never be a part of a, a born-again Christian's life. Also, I don't believe fear of this illness should put a chokehold on Christian fellowship. Uh, as this virus issue develops in the coming months, we as a church, I believe, will have to decide how we're gonna react to it. And uh, I believe we have to react with power, with love, and with a sound mind. Uh, our text again is found in 2 Corinthians, cha I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter one. Timothy, whose name was, it means valued of God here, seems to have been struggling with a bit of timidity and uh, he was reacting in fear uh, to those challenges he faced in his ministry. I want to pick up uh, a reading in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 6 where Paul is going to call Timothy to courage. He says, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. In other words, I'm asking you Timothy, telling you Timothy to rekindle your courage. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. But of, and here's the triad, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. This verse is our call to make a decision to live in courage. That's what he's calling us to do, to live in courage. We should not live in fear uh, of what the world thinks about our relationship with God. We shouldn't live in fear. They should live in fear of facing God someday. Amen. That's who should be in fear. It shouldn't be us. He goes on to, in verse 9 to tell us why we should take courage and not fear. First of all, he says, who has saved us. He saved our souls from an eternity in hell. How much does that mean to me? Oh, it means everything. He goes on to say, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So God in his magnificent power 
ordained through an act of grace, even before there even was time, that our salvation would be by faith in his Son, in Jesus Christ, not by works, totally removing the fear of falling short or losing what we gained. And I think this is a tremendous call to courage. When he took works off the table, oh, did that change the game? Did that ever change the game? Look at verse 10. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished, he has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Verses 9 and 10 are our motivation to make a decision to live in courage. The battle is already won. Our worst enemy, death, has already been destroyed. It's been destroyed. So we can take courage. To which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason I also suffer these things. So Paul is saying that because I know these things are true, I will courageously pay the price, whatever it is, to serve God. And what was the price he ended up paying? His life. He gave his life. You know, honestly, guys, I think a lot of that, when that happens, we, we grieve the loss of another believer in Christ. But in essence, I think what God is doing for that man is allowing him to give that sacrifice so that when he gets to heaven, God can give him full reward. That's what's happening there for all Paul did. Nothing was, nothing was going to stop God from giving full reward. So he took the axe that was used to chop off his head as a means to turn the tables and reward that man mightily when he stood before his God. He says, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I'm not afraid to be numbered with the believers. I'm not afraid. He said, for I know whom I have believed, and I am absolutely persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which ye have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. In other words, stand in courage. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. So God has given us the Holy Spirit as our source of courageous power. We have that spirit within us. We have that spirit. So the key verse in this passage, of course, is verse 7. For God has not given us or bestowed upon us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we're presented here with two opposing spirits. There are two opposing spirits, the spirit of fear and the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. They are, they are, the, these two spirits are diametrically opposed to each other. They are, they are not the same. They are opposites. Fear can be a very powerful force, though, can it not? It can be. Fear can be a powerful force. But power, love, and a sound mind, when properly aligned in our hearts, can overcome any fear. Amen. It can give us the courage to move forward. So God's solution to fear and panic is presented to us here uh, in the remaining part of that, that same verse. Look at 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not bestowed upon us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So the spirit gives us... Um, Three things that are, are designed to overcome fear. The first is power, and we looked at that. The second is love, and the third is a sound mind. We're to develop these three characteristics within us um, and use them effectively to engage fear in battle. What has fear stopped you from doing? Moving forward. Yeah, moving forward. Fear will stop you from moving forward. You know a loved one needs to hear the gospel, but we're afraid sometimes. We're afraid. What will they think? Uh, Paul is calling us on the carpet with these, with these scriptures here to move forward with courage. And um, that courage is founded, in, in my opinion, of the three pieces, the power, the love, and the sound mind. The most powerful of those three is love. So two weeks ago, we saw that the Greek word here for power is dunamis, uh, and we get our English word dynamite from that. And, and this dunamis is, 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 is the power that allows God to see the future and blast a path that we can proceed safely down as we go through our lives. Uh, he is, his hand is on us, and he, is, and he has positioned us where he wants us, uh, and he will use us accordingly. But we add to this arsenal the second leg of the triad, and that is the spirit of love. 
So 1 Timothy 1.7 read that way, For God hath bestowed upon us the spirit of love. So seriously, the spirit of love. Um, how can love be weaponized to take on an enemy like fear? Um, how can love be a formidable spiritual weapon at all? Uh, how can love effectively engage in battle with the spirit of fear? What does love have to do with war at all? Except that all is fair in love and war. Well, love and warfare would seem to mix like oil and water. But truly, honestly, it was the love of God that led to overcoming all things. We all know that God is righteous, right? He is righteous. And in his righteousness, he cannot allow a sinner to be in his presence. But God, in his great love for his creation, provided a means whereby you and I can be righteous in his presence. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the price for our sins, which allowed him to be righteous by making us righteous. So through the work of Christ in atonement for our sins, his justice is not violated, but actually is satisfied as God spares us as sinners. This is all done because of God's great love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The power of love. So I believe God that, that, that love is God's core attribute, by the way, that I do. We, we study his attributes, all of his attributes, and you really have a difficult time studying his attributes without having them blend into each other. To separate one out is very difficult. But I believe all those attributes, all the other attributes are overshadowed by one main attribute, and that is his great love. I believe that is his strongest attribute. The spirit of love does two things that give us power in this spiritual battle against fear. Number one, it bonds us to our commander in chief. It bonds us to our savior. And number two, it bonds us to each other as we, as we go through this world. It does those two things. It is the glue that unites me and him. And it is the glue that unites you and me. It is love. It is love. So let's look at how love bonds us with our commander in chief. Am I talking funny? I sound funny to me. My, because uh, the, it's, uh, the anesthesia stuff is still kicking me. He says, in Romans, let's go to Romans 8, 15. And then we're going to see now here, like I said, how love bonds us with our commander-in-chief. And notice that, as in our core verse, we're going to read of the spirit within us. The spirit within us is what? Power, love, and a sound mind. That is the spirit that is within us. We're going to read here in Romans 8, 15, another aspect of that spirit within us. He says, for you have not received the spirit that makes you fearful slaves. You have not received that spirit. He says we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. What that means is that we have not received the spirit that makes you fearful slaves. But you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That is that spirit within us, the, the, uh, the, the spirit of love, our Father for us as his children. Remember what goes on there. When we got saved, and he says that spirit of adoption, we talked about it in the men's meeting this morning. We not only got adopted into his family, we got his very DNA within us in the new man. He lives within us. He lives within us. Verse 16, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are loved as the children of God. So since we're loved as his children, we are then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we, might, that we may be also glorified together. The new man is not received as a slave to live in terror uh, of threatened punishment uh, as, we, as we were when we were under the law. It is as you go through life and Psalms 23 was written, uh, verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That verse has hit me hard uh, again and again and again as I read that verse. When man goes through life, the shadow of death looms over that man. As it, it does, doesn't it? It is there. 
And it creates within the lost mind a fear, a terror, that someday I will face death. And I don't want to face what's behind the curtain when I do. Well, when we got saved, when you got born again, when you became a believer in Jesus Christ, when you were adopted into his family, that shadow was lifted. We now have vision into what we have in front of us. We now know what's in front of us, and we look forward to it with great glee. And that's a very, that, that very thought should give us courage. So as an adopted child, we approach God as his child and call him Father. Being born again makes us one with our Savior. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Okay, so our loving relationship with him gives us the confidence to stand in the spirit of love in this present evil world without fear. I'm standing with my Father. In fact, I dare say I'm standing behind my Father as he goes before me with his dunamis power clearing away. I need fear nothing in this world, and it is because of his great love for me. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14, the Lord tells us, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And John 3.16 tells us that this was entirely motivated by love. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in him. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. In other words, we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. In his love, he made some commitments to me when he saved my soul. I will never face judgment for my sin. He took that on himself. He replaced me. He, he literally took my sins upon him on that cross. Literally. And in that time, the Father turned away from the Son. And that was done out of such of an act of love as my human brain cannot comprehend. But he loved us that much. He loved each of us that much. That he would do that. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane and the, 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 the torn heart? The agony as he stressed over this whole thing. Love drove him forward. Love overcame all of that. So his love for me is not just adequate. His love for me is overpowering. It is dunamis on steroids. He goes on to say, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Our love is made perfect because we may have boldness in the day of judgment. When we stand before him, and we are judged righteous because of what Jesus Christ did for us. That was an act of love. Pure love. Pure love. Is he, and he goes on to say in verse 16, God is love. The easiest part of that verse to memorize, really, right? God is love. That's what he is. That's his essence. And he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. And that boldness, like I say, was made possible by God's great love. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. No fear in love. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. So if I'm fearful, I have a problem here. Right? I haven't yet grasped the depth of how much my Heavenly Father really loves me. Verse 19 says we love Him because He first loved us. That's very important to grasp. He loved me so much before I loved Him that He went to the cross, took my sins upon Him, literally died because of my actions, and then rose again uh, to provide for my future. That is an act of love that has never been and never will be equaled in the history of mankind. Never will. But verse 18 is so precious. He says, there is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. It's thrown out. There's no room for it. These diametrically opposed spirits, one of fear, one of love. There is no room for this one if this one is dominant in your hearts. You grasp the love of God. I'm telling you, fear will fly like darkness does before light. It will, it will happen. So he says God is love here, and it's the very essence, I, like I say, of, of, of what I believe he is. 
And we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. Through this love, we need not fear the day of judgment. I think that's one of the neatest things. He loved us so much, taking my sin upon him on that cross, that I won't be judged for my sins. He is judged in my stead. And he being judged righteous, I am therefore righteous. So, in fact, his love to us and ours to him is powerful enough to cast off all fear. Did you ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs and wonder how those people could go to their deaths and say, bring it on? You know, it's because they had realized how much God loved them. They had realized. Uh, they had settled that in their hearts. That's what we need to do today. We need to settle this in our hearts. So we have to conclude that there's no fear, no fear in a loving relationship between me and my Savior. There is no fear. Now we fear him in an awe way, right? We are in awe of him, of course. Uh, just as we respect and love our, our earthly fathers, you take that times exponentially. That's how much we respect our heavenly father. We are in awe of him. So sure, there is that, that type of fear. But a terrorizing type of fear? Oh no. Oh no. That's gone. Not for the world, but for us it is gone. So we have to conclude that there's no fear in a loving relationship between me and my Savior. Fear has been put aside. He loved me that much. There's a second pillar of strength in love, and I believe the spirit of love not only binds me to my Savior as our commander-in-chief with our triad, right? But it bonds us to each other. It bonds us to each other. 1 John 4.19 tells us that because of his love for us, we love each other. He loved me, therefore I love you. That's how that works. Fellow believers, we are that way. Love gives us, a, as we're soldiers in the Lord's army, right, special, uh, a special code of conduct that brings out its true potential. I'm in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. And he says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If any has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Bond, the bond of love overlooks, <laughs> overlooks a lot. It really does. The bond of love overlooks a lot. I imagine uh, probably nobody in this room gave their mom a better run than I gave mine. Uh, I doubt it. Uh, in fact, um, I might win that trophy. I don't know. But I tell you what, she overlooked all that uh, in, in, her, in her love for me. And uh, I, that's what the Lord did. When he looked at me as he was taking my sins upon himself, he didn't see me as that uh, despicable sinner. He saw me as his son. His love for me did what he did. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So love is the bond uh, found in, I believe, spiritually mature believers. There's a bond of love there that just is very real. Rather than love uh, of self, uh, this is love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the difference between the world's love and our love for each other. It's the same with, if you take two people who are not saved, who don't know the Lord, and they fall in love, like, say Granny and I, we are in love with each other as long as our partner does things that make us happy. As soon as that's no longer there, in a world relationship, we fall out of love. Might as well call it off, right? As far as God is concerned, this act of love, this attitude of love, when we look at each other now as born-again believers, we look at each other to see what can I do to satisfy you. Not what can you do to satisfy me. That's the difference there in this love. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Because I'm looking beyond issues, all those issues, overlooking those things to see someone that Jesus Christ loves as a child just as he does me. Verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. 
So it's hard to be thankful without having love for fellow believers. It's, it's, it's just not possible. It's just not possible. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So love unites us into a single effective force in our spiritual war. When one of our brothers and sisters falls to the spirit of fear, what should the rest of us do? Pick them up. Stand in that, stand in, stand in the gap is a commonly used phrase these days, but you stand in for them. Uh, buck them up. Uh, encourage them. Pray for them. Lead them to a, a, a better place. Love them. Uh, when we choose to allow loving peace to rule in our hearts, it makes a whole world of difference in any church relationship at all. It really does. So Paul tells us uh, we, have to, we have to choose to, to show tender-hearted mercy. This is something we should commit to, right? Tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness to our family as believers. That's where we should be. And we have to make allowance for each other's faults and, and forgive those who offend you. These are acts of love. Uh, this is easier to do when you remember that the Lord forgave us first. Right? He first loved us, so we love each other. So it's easier to do when I remember what he did for me. And God would like that to be what people see when they view us. When they view us, the difference they should see between us and the world should be that love. And if we do that, we're going to unite together in perfect harmony. Isn't that the Coca-Cola song? <laughs> perfect harmony? Yeah. That's, you know, it should be Pepsi. But in our case here, that's what God's goal is for us. Fear will be totally displaced by love. It will. So as members of one family and one body, we're called to live in peace. That's what, that's what that love does. That's the power of that love. So we are to always also be thankful. Let's look at what Paul wrote to the Ephesian church about this. Listen for the key word in this passage, okay? Listen for the key word. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. What is the key word in that passage? One. I believe it's one. It's one. There's not two. There's one. So Paul is begging them um, and us to lead a life worthy of our calling. He wants us to always be humble and gentle. We're to be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of our love. We're to make every effort to keep ourselves united in the Spirit. Every effort. Every effort there. Amen. Uh, making allowance for each other's faults because of our love. Uh, we have to realize that there is one body and one Spirit, one glorious hope for the future, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, in you all, and living through all. We are all so tightly weaved together that we cannot separate from each other. Amen. The only one that could do that to us is Satan. And the only thing he can do that with is fear. There are not two. No body of believers will really be any stronger than the extent to which they manifest God's love by loving one another. I believe that wholeheartedly. No body of believers will really be any stronger than the extent to which they manifest God's love by loving one another. That's the difference between us and the world. It really is. The church has no more effective way, I don't believe, to testify to the world uh, about the love of Jesus Christ for them than to display the Savior's love in the fellowship we have with each other. That display is what draws people to this church. Uh, 
you talk to our, our newer folks that come, they, they, they see it, they felt it, they enjoy it. We cannot let Satan steer us off course. We can't let him do that. I don't think anything is more critical to spreading the gospel than understanding that God is love and that we should be loved too. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I have become sounding brass and a clanging symbol. So the most, the most eloquent message, I mean, you know I'm not elegant. Elegant? Elegant? Eloquent. Eloquent. Or elegant. Or elegant. You know I'm not those. But if I was, and I delivered the best, most eloquent message that ever was, and I didn't have love as a part of that, it would just simply grate on your nerves, wouldn't it? It would. You'd say, isn't there a football game on or something? What time do we blow this joint? Yeah. Verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Nothing. Faith without love is meaningless. It is powerful. Powerless. Verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love is to be the motivation for all our actions. Love is to be it. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquities, but rejoices in the truth. Goes with what Jose was saying earlier. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Verse 8, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there be tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Nothing but love endures. That's how powerful love is. It is the only force in the world that will endure. Verse 13, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three. There's another triad for us. But the greatest of these is love. It is love. All things boil down to one thing. That is love. It boils down to that. When we realize how much God loves us and how much his love works, we need not fear any enemy. We need not fear at all. Because as we read in 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love. There is no fear there. When we realize we have Christian brothers and sisters who love us, we know we have partners in, in, in the great battle against fear. We are partnered together in this. We, we church, uh, Sage Creek Bible Church, and other churches across our country and around the world, we're partnered in this. To wrap this up here, uh, let me just say that the strength that is found in the spirit of, of, of God, of love, that God gives us is absolutely enormous. The strength of that is enormous. I, um, I have small taste of that in my uh, relationship with Granny. I depend on her love for me so much that it would ruin me if I ever lost it. It, it would ruin me. It would be the destruction of me. It would be the absolute tear me down, never get back up again thing in my life that would destroy me. The only thing that would hurt more, I think, is to think that God had abandoned me. But in his love, he is telling me, that'll never happen. You don't have to fear any of that. That is gone. That is gone. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. So what replaces that fear is confidence. Confidence in our God. I am confident that he is not going to discard me because I did something stupid yesterday, you know? We'll get it right, we'll get this thing done, and we'll work through it, and, uh, but love is never taken off the table. He says, because fear has torment. 1 John 4, 18, probably a verse we should memorize. Fear has torment, and he never torments us as our Father. Never torments us. He that fears is not made perfect in love. So I see here and fully believe that the spirit of love itself 
without any other help, is strong enough to cast out the spirit of fear. All in of its own. Psalms 118 verse 6 says, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? So in the great spiritual battle that's going on around us, I don't believe we can allow fear to make us clear the battlefield. Uh, remember what Winston Churchill said, fear is a reaction, courage is a decision. If you haven't already, I want you to make a decision. This all drives to this. I want you to make a commitment with me that you will not fear what God has overcome. And he has overcome all things. Amen. And I hope in the course of just going through these verses on love today that you see the tools that you need to stand fast in his love. That fear may not rock you back on your feet. Right? The ones who really should fear and be shaking in their boots are the ones that don't know the Lord. Really, they're the ones who should be clearing the battlefield in absolute terror. They really should. Even the evil spirits know enough to be afraid. James 2.19 says, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. They know their day is coming. They themselves fear that great terror. Remember what they said when the Lord, are you come to crush us before the time? They were terrorized. They were absolutely terrorized. And the world out there without Christ ought to be shaken in their boots so much that we could hear their knees knocking right now. I tell you, that's who should be shaking in their boots, those that don't know the Lord. Because the great day of the Lord will be a terror to them like they had never imagined. And if that, that very thought should break our hearts. Really, that we have this love. And we have this love to share. We have it to share. Hebrews 10, 27 tells us that those who are unsaved also live with this, this certain fearful looking for of judgment. Remember that cloud that hangs over them uh, and fiery indignation that will someday devour them. They live in fear. We have the answer to that fear. Eternity for those evil spirits along with Satan as they look out for what's in front of them is desperately dark. And worse yet, it's unchangeable. It's committed. God is committed. For those out in the world who need to hear the gospel, they're not committed yet, right? They're not dead yet. So let's take them the gospel. Let's do that. Put your faith in Christ as you go. He'll give you the courage to speak and, and you'll be able to See the joy on people's faces as they realize that they've been forgiven and that redemption is theirs and they no longer need to fear their future. They no longer need to fear. And all that was done as an act of love. So for me, as we wrap this up, that triad of the Lord, power, that's my favorite. Dunamis power, explosive, blowing things up, awesome, uh, constant action, Bright colors flashing everywhere. Pretty neat, right? Love, I think, trumps that. I think it does. I think it is more powerful uh, in its own right than the other two, and the third one being a sound mind. Now, when we get back together on this same subject in, I think, two weeks, we will be talking about the power of a sound mind, removing fear from our thought processes and how that helps us. Any thoughts before we close today? I hope you walk out of here today so confident in God's love that your feet never even touch the ground while you walk. That's what I hope. All right? Amen. All right? All right. Um, Jose, um, my voice is done. Would you close us in prayer, please, sir? Heavenly Father, what a wonderful message we received today that your love has conquered all and uh, has given us as your love is in us, in all, enabling us to have uh, victory over fear. And uh, as, as Terry said, uh, it should lift us up, Lord, higher than uh, anything that the world can throw at us. And as a matter of fact, it can throw everything at us and it's still going to accomplish your will and it's still going to have victory in the world and the gates of hell shall not prevail. I pray, Father, that as we dismiss now, that we would go up, uh, go along our week, and uh, that we go forward in the name of Jesus Christ. And as we 
partake in the food downstairs that you bless into our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.